Turn to Luke 14, if you would. And I, I just want to take a couple minutes and just, um, I, maybe this is therapeutic, this is cathartic for me, but you may think of the Morgan family as, uh, and when I say Morgan family, my wife, Lori, me, my, my three kids, Riley, Addison, Hudson. Now, I hear you guys sing the praises of our family, and I, I'm grateful for that, but you need to know there's a dark side to the, to the Morgans. <laughs> and, and some of you are like, you're kidding me, a dark side. And I'm going to really expose a little bit of what goes on in the inner recesses of the Morgan home, specifically at a particular time of day called dinner time. <laughs> and I want you to know that the, uh, the, the sense of, um, I, I love eating, and those of you guys that look at me Obviously, you go, makes sense. Um, I have the spiritual gift of eating. That's why I say to people, um, one of my favorite passages in the Bible is the Psalms where it says, come let us worship and chow down. Uh, that's, that's like one of my favorite sections. So, so mealtime is an important time for us. But, but mealtime over the past year has become less joyful and more judgy. And I'm going to tell you the, 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 the persecution, I, and that, I'm using that word inten- intentionally, the persecution that I experienced from my family at dinner time. <laughs> um, and and it, it doesn't let up. It actually gets worse. And I was actually going to prepare a list of 10 commandments that my family, they haven't organized, but they live every single meal <laughs> together. Thou shalt not. There, I think there's 10 of them. And, and I'm the one that gets this brunt, tr- this horrible treatment of this. And yeah, thank you. I need this. I need this because I don't know how many more dinners I'm going to be able to, to withstand with, with my family. So I'm sitting there and I'm enjoying my meal. And I love, you know, the dinner table. There's something wonderful about it, connecting, seeing your kids and your wife and enjoying a, and I'm, and it. Doesn't, it could be a, a cup of noodles. It could be a, a beef wellington. It doesn't matter. I feel that the company and the time is important, but my family, does, they don't feel the same way. <laughs> Dad, we can hear you chewing. <laughs> Stop. I mean, I love kettle chips, and I love granola, and I, I mean, you can't be quiet and chew that kind of food, right? So what's the, what's the remedy? Let's turn some music on while we eat. Let's mask Dad's chewing. If it's not only that, it's how I I take food off my spoon. Dad, we hear your teeth on the spoon. Dad, the way you're sitting is not appropriate. What, I can't cross my legs and eat a filet? Dad, we're hearing you slurp your water. Dad, we want to eat. We don't want to talk about our day. We don't want to talk about spiritual things. <laughs> How much? Dad, don't reach for the chips. It's ask for the bowl. <laughs> You're putting too much sauce on your food. And everyone gets done and leaves the table and goes watch it. And there's dad still eating. This is kind of the joke. Like, there's dad still eating at the table. Why? Because I want to savor the moment. Damn me if you will. I enjoy my family too much, okay? You know what? It's actually gotten better now that I eat in a different room by myself. <laughs> you, get, you guys, yeah. <laughs> Bathroom, everything's there. I got water, I got the toilet, everything I need. <laughs> you ever been in an environment where you felt like you're totally scrutinized? You ever been in an environment? All joking aside. Pray for, pray for my family. <laughs> no, I love it. We, we laugh. I don't care. You know, since I gave up hope, I feel a lot better. So I just eat. I enjoy my food. I don't care what they're thinking or what they're doing, right? Like, be all judgy. Okay, whatever. They judge Jesus too. So we're in good company. But all joking aside, and I told my family ahead of time I'm going to be talking about them. They're like, what are you going to say? I said, well, you just wait. <laughs> the meal table is an important table. Jesus spent a lot of time at the table with people. Think about the ministry of Jesus around food. And not every time there was a meal and Jesus was there, was it a a comfortable setting? As you're going to see this morning. Jesus loved mealtime moments because meal, a meal is something we all hold in common, isn't it? It's, It's something that we all enjoy. We all have to eat, right? 
why not include somebody else and get to know them and talk to them? And, and so Jesus loved uh, the mealtime. So many scenes where Jesus takes an ordinary meal and turns it into something profound and significant. It doesn't matter what the food is. What matters is perhaps the company and the conversation. The common connection over a meal gives us a chance to celebrate one another. A chance to celebrate our differences, to celebrate our uniqueness, to celebrate our individuality. I mean, if you think about the Gospels, right, there's the wedding feast at Cana. Where guess who bought, brought the best wine? Jesus. Like, if you invite Jesus to your party, guess who's going to bring an awesome wine? The Savior. Think about the time Jesus took an ordinary lunch from a boy of bread and fish and ended up feeding 10,000 plus people. What a celebration. What a moment, right? Think about Martha's kitchen. Even though it wasn't mealtime yet, there was preparation to be had. And, and perhaps Martha was a little too fixated on the physical food that she was preparing to miss the spiritual food that Jesus was offering. Think about the, the prostitute who comes into the Pharisee's home during the mealtime, right? Totally socially unacceptable, but she doesn't care because she's tired of living in the shame and the guilt, and she beelines it during dinner time at the Pharisee's house to Jesus' feet and, and pours her life out before him. Think about the the Last Supper, that last moment Jesus has with his disciples, right? He's heading to the cross. And not everyone at that table likes Jesus. And yet he spends that meal with them and even institutes communion, right? The bread and the, and the juice signifying and symbolic of something greater and deeper. Post-resurrection, Jesus appears to his disciples on the beach and they have fish breakfast together. You ever thought about having fish for breakfast? It's a very international thing, thing to do. But Jesus loved sharing meals with people. And probably one of the greatest realizations we have as believers is to realize that he himself is the greatest meal we could ever, ever enjoy. He is the bread. He is the water. He is the food that truly satisfies and when we talk about food and meals it's it's this it's this a, it's a pointer to a feast that is promised to every single one of us called the marriage supper of the lamb that god is preparing right now and he's got seats at the table for those of us who love jesus and he's preparing seats for those who have yet to love jesus isn't that awesome? And he is going to prepare a meal. He's going to clothe us in, in such an amazing fashion. And we're going to be in the most diverse and enjoyable company for eternity. This is why God has, has designed this world the way he has. And specifically when it comes to food and our appetites, it's because he says, I want to satisfy the deepest longing you've ever had for food or drink and company when we're going to dine forever together at that feast. What a day that's going to be. What a meal that is going to be. And boy, I'm, I, I keep preparing myself for that meal now. So you got to train now to eat a lot there. All right? And there's not going to be judging. I can, I, can te I can put my teeth on my fork, and Jesus isn't going to condemn me for it. Right? But we need to learn how to love and appreciate and accept one another. And that's it's really the lesson before us in Luke 14. Look at this passage as Jesus once again goes to another dinner. All the dinners and the galas and all the events. Jesus was a busy cat, wasn't he? Luke 14, verse 1. He's invited to one of the, not just a Pharisee, but a leading Pharisee. So, like, this is, like, the pinnacle of societal recognition. You're going to the leading Pharisee's house? What? So, verse 1, chapter 14. Came about, Jesus went to the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees on the Sabbath to eat bread, that they were watching him closely. And there in front of Jesus was a certain man suffering from dropsy. And Jesus answered and spoke to the lawyers and the Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they kept silent. 
He took a hold of the man and healed him and sent him away. And he says to them, which one of you shall have a son or an ox fall into a well and will not immediately pull him out of that well on the Sabbath day? And they can make no reply to this. And he began to speak a parable to the invited guests when he noticed how they had been picking out the places of honor at the table, saying to them, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you may be invited by them. And he who invited you both shall come and say to you, give place to this man, and then in disgrace you proceed to occupy the last place. But when you're invited... Go recline at the last place so that when the one who has been invited comes, he may say to you, friend, come, move up higher. Then you will have honor in the sight of all who are at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself shall be humbled, and he who humbles himself shall be exalted. And he also went on to say to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your neighbors or your relatives or your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and repayment come to you. But when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. And you will be blessed since they do not have the means to repay you, for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. May God write his eternal truths upon our hearts this morning so two things that jesus identifies as being very dangerous within our hearts two things number one is there's the dangerous practice of hypocrisy the dangerous practice of hypocrisy so here's this special lunch engagement it's on the sabbath day which is a day of rest and he's invited to the leading Pharisee's house. And this day of rest and worship is anything but a day of rest and worship for these Pharisees and these lawyers. I mean, you think of all the days when we can just stop being judgmental and condemning and scrutinizing. It should be the Lord's day, right? But this is the day where these guys shine the best as being the best of hypocrites. Right? Because... This was to be a day where their focus is on God, but the only thing they could focus is on how much they don't like Jesus. Look at, look at verse 1. They were there with Jesus, and it says at the end of verse 1, they were watching him closely. Literally, they had this insidious mentality where they were going to look specifically for any evil intent within this man. Can you imagine walking into a, a room and just having someone just leering, sneering, gazing at you and looking for any one step, misstep, one mishap, anything to come down on you? See, they're watching Jesus not out of reverence and respect, but they're watching him out of rivalry and revenge. They don't like his message. They don't like his methods. They don't line up with everything they believe and how they behave. So therefore, they're looking for a way to trap him. So instead of showing hospitality, they're showing their hostility. This is the nature of legalism. Let's, let's find out how many people we can attack and destroy and, and condemn, not because we care for them, but because we want to continue to self-promote ourselves. Make ourselves appear better, put the facade, make sure there's a glossier facade on there, a shinier facade, a more sparkly facade. And so here they are longing to judge them, but what they don't realize is that they're the ones who will be judged. Yes! Don't you love it? Don't you love how Jesus masterfully turns the tables? You guys think this is about me? We're going to turn this to be about you. Instead of loving God and loving others, they love themselves and they love their positions. But he's going to reveal their false piety. Three ways he's going to do that. Number one, he's going, to, uh, he's going to go to an appeal to extend help. See, there's a man that is there and he's suffering from what is called dropsy. Today it's called edema. It is when your liver, your kidneys begin to fail, then it affects your heart and there's a swelling of the blood tissue with water, and it is pretty terminal. 
and it and a person who's suffering from edema begins to take on grotesque appearance and you think this guy was invited to be a part of the lunch these men were using this dude and they were using him to trap jesus See, when you use people like this, this is, this is something that's evident about your, your hard and callous heart. Right? This man wasn't invited because he was welcome there. He was invited because he was going to be a pawn to trap Jesus. They staged this event. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you don't love God, you're certainly not going to love your neighbor. And if you're not going to love your neighbor, you certainly can't say you love God. 1 John chapter 3, read that this week. If you use others to somehow prop up yourself, you certainly (laughs) would use God to do the same. These men are notorious for using God and using people to make themselves look better. And so to the Pharisees, there's this man with dropsy or edema that they are going to use to make themselves look better. And specifically because their theology said if this man is suffering this way, there's certainly some sort of grievous sin in his heart. So he needs to get right with God but in their no way going to help him do that. We can't help others if we're blind to anyone who doesn't follow our list of acceptable behaviors and beliefs. Can I I just tell you, there's there's not going to be one person you ever come in contact with who doesn't need your help. I don't care if they don't look like you. I don't care if they don't listen to the same music. I don't care if they don't vote like you. I don't care if they root for a different NFL team. It doesn't matter. If someone is presented to you who needs help, you help. You help because our hypocrisy makes us short-sighted to the needs all around us. Our hypocrisy, right, that says, you know, I can't help this person because they may not give me something in return. I can't help this person because they don't vote like me. I, I can't help this person because, you know, we just have differences. That is not the mentality of Christ. I am thankful for every healing that Jesus does in the Gospels. He doesn't give them a 10-question questionnaire beforehand said well i'll help you if you go ahead and follow these steps and you can only miss eight out of ten if you want me to help you he doesn't do that jesus helps notice how quickly he helps look at one it's not even one verse look at this it says right there in verse four they kept silent and then the second half of the verse he takes the man heals him sends him on his way very unceremoniously because that man's life has been changed But that's not what Jesus is trying to get at with this account. See, these men are using Jesus' desire to show compassion as a means to condemn him. I'm going to tell you right now, I hope you're all condemned because of your compassion. Didn't they do the same with Daniel? If we're going to get Daniel, this guy is living such an upright life. I guess the only area we can get Daniel in is in his prayer life. And they, they arrest Daniel because why? He's a praying man. May you all be condemned and convicted by how merciful and how compassionate you are. Amen? You will never go wrong at the end of the day by showing love. Point number two, he appeals to show love. Love will never grow where legalism is the fertilizer. Love will never grow where your penchant for condemning and criticizing others because they don't match your spirituality, love will not grow in a heart that uses that kind of fertilizer. Legalism cannot manifest itself as love and compassion. So you know what the true disease is in this passage? It's not dropsy or edema. The true disease is hypocrisy on full display. What's not swollen is this man's condition after he's been healed by jesus what is truly swollen is the men who have pride in their hearts who are trying to test and trap jesus see from the point of view of jesus this man had fallen into a deep well of suffering and he was a son who needed saving not a sinner who needed scolding can i tell you right now you're going to come in contact with people who do not need you to be the Holy Spirit in their lives. People are already wrecked in their hearts and their souls and their spirits. They don't need you adding to that. They need you to help alleviate that. Amen? 
We are self-critical. We are masters at self-criticism. You need to hear an opposite message. That you can be loved as you are where you are. No matter what you've done, no matter what's been done to you, this man who has been healed is immediately touched by the, 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 the mercy and love of Christ, and then he's sent away. It's an interesting question, is that why is the man sent away? Why doesn't he stay? Because Jesus is about to, to open a can of whoop-ass. <laughs> and this man has already experienced enough whoop-ass in his life. He doesn't need to be there for more whoop-ass. Can I get an amen from somebody? Amen. There, Jesus, this, listen to this. Jesus wants this man to know even though this is not a safe place, he's a safe person. But he doesn't want this man to continue to experience what he's experienced all his life, perhaps. So he sends him away. And, and ladies and gentlemen, I think this is an important point. You need to become a safe person to people. And I would encourage you to create safe places, but sometimes you can't create safe places, but you can be a safe person in an unsafe place. Create an environment that welcomes people instead of damning people. And if someone enters a damning situation, be the person that's a security for them. Be an anchor for them. Sometimes we find ourselves in situations where we feel like Daniel in the lion's den. And people are voracious and they're hungry and they want to just chow down on someone's soul so that they feel better. Stop. Be a safe person and love somebody. Because if not, you may feel the Lord's rebuke on your own heart. So he turns the table on these guys, and he does it by asking two questions. And I will tell you that a well-placed question some kind can disar- sometimes can disarm the most volatile situation. So he leverages two questions. The first question has to do with principle. The second question has to do with practice. Notice the principle. He says in in, in verse 3, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Second, if your son falls into a well. And I know some of you are like, well, it depends. I mean, I may not. Maybe he needs it. Wells can become great places of teaching moments. Not, Not that I know that from experience. Or maybe I do, I don't know. Invite me over to dinner, we'll find out. <laughs> you see, it would be one thing for Jesus and his critics to differ over principle, but it's an entirely different matter when these critics, what they profess is different than what they practice. Right? That's, the, that's hypocrisy. You know, no one likes hypocrisy. We even saw it this week. GameStop. This is one of the best stories. I was telling my wife, I was like, they need to make a movie out of this. This would be so fun. If you don't know, some of you are like, what's this whole GameStop thing all about? It's about hypocrisy in the marketplace. And, oh, yeah. <laughs> See, not to get into details, but the hedge fund bad boys, billionaires, were mad that they got played at their own game. And you know what? Anytime there's a David Goliath situation that goes on, you all have to admit, we do like David in those moments, right? And, and, that's exa- and now there's all this, you know, we're going to get the SEC out to investigate. They're not going to find anything. They're just mad that someone else got a taste of the success of what these guys have been enjoying so long. The billionaire hedge fund, hedge fund boys club got played by the dark corners of the Reddit threads armchair investors that they never thought would be able to play one on them, and they did. And a kid who invested $500 ends up yielding tens of thousands of dollars. Why? Because the hedge fund guys were like, let's bully this little company that's already suffering. And the Reddit guy said, no, you're not. Pretty awesome. Never bet against the little guy. God doesn't. Amen? God doesn't. So, Jesus asked some questions. And it's kind of a catch-22 moment. And Jesus has been on the receiving end of these kind of things. 
right? The woman caught in the act of adultery, John chapter 8. They said, what should we do with this woman? Because we literally caught her in the act. They went in the room. She's having sex with this guy. They pull her off this man she's having intercourse with, and they stand her half naked in front of Jesus. They say, Jesus, we just caught her in the act of adultery. What should we do? And he doesn't say anything. He stoops and writes on the ground, right? Because if he says stoner, then he's not as merciful and compassionate as he said he was. But if he says let her go, then he's soft on law. So he's silent. He turns the tables right here, does the same thing. If you don't rescue your son or an ox, you're heartless. And no one wants to be a part of a faith that doesn't show mercy to others. But if he says, leave the son or the ox, right? Then he is, uh, no, rescue, then he's lawless, meaning he's soft on the law. So they think they got him trapped. And just when you think you have God trapped, you don't. Showing mercy, ladies and gentlemen, is always right. Write that down. Showing mercy is always right. And if you're sitting there wrestling because you are called to show mercy, but you're wrestling with your religious observance, I'm going to tell you right now, your religious observance is a sham. Always show mercy. We are always called to love our neighbors. We're always called to seek the well-being of others. We're always called to be those who show mercy to other people, right? And this is what Jesus tries to show these guys. This is hypocrisy at its finest, and this is why they can't respond to him. They know they're trapped. The silence only incriminates them more. And yet here he is, right? The last thing is, here's his appeal to, to reflect grace. How many dinners has Jesus been at at a Pharisee's house in the Gospels? One more than I would ever go to. But he does it. Because this is the way the Savior is. There's always an opportunity to show someone grace. He's not only gracious to the man who's been healed, He's extremely gracious to the religious leaders. Think about their stubbornness and his consistent time he spends with them. He shows grace to the sick as well to the hypocritical. And he sits with them in their silence, but he's going to press in a little deeper. Jesus realizes that, okay, these guys are, these guys are maybe thinking, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go in a little bit deeper. He's, the knife is going to cut a little bit harder. Point number two. See, not only is there the dangerous practice of hypocrisy, there's the dangerous pursuit of honor. One of my favorite verses is out of 1 Samuel chapter 3 where it says, He who honors me, I will honor. See, this is really the, the topic of, of humility. And I would say that humility is the queen of all Christian graces. Humility. Humility. It, it's, it's one of those great works of God in our lives that, that's really a passive virtue. You can't sit there and go, I'm going to work on humility today. Because then once you work on it, you're going to go tell someone how well you've done with humility that day. That doesn't work. Right? Humility is the result of, of walking and loving God and walking and loving people. It's, it's being others-centered, others-focused. It's, it's, it's em embodying Philippians chapter 2 when you realize in this section, Philippians chapter 2, 1 through 4, consider others as more important than yourselves. Get rid of empty, emptiness, conceit, self-centeredness. Be like Jesus, who? And then it goes into that beautiful passage where he emptied himself and became a servant of us and you know, that passage in Philippians 2 was a song. It was a song in the early church. And when you turn something into a song, you must really mean it, right? Throw a little melody on there. It's like, oh, this thing, this thing moves. I like it. But humility is one of those, those things. N no one ever sets out and writes a book. And if, if they have, don't buy it. Humility and how I attained it. Don't, don't buy that book. You can't. Thomas, uh, uh, Albert Einstein. You know what Einstein said one time? He said, don't try to become a person of success, but try to become a person of value. You know what I know this world values? Humility. That's why we espouse people like Mother Teresa. She sends, she's like the poster person for humility, isn't she? 
You want to know why? Because every time a, a, a busload of shoes came to the orphanages she led in India, she would go through every pair of those sh shoes and find the worst ones and take them out so that no one got the worst pair. That, that's humility. See, most people wear an invisible sign that reads, please make me feel important. You do not exist to make you yourself feel important. You exist to help make someone else feel important. Every single person. Imagine if you had that, the, the, those glasses on each and every day. You go to work, you go to school, you're with your neighbors, and you see that invisible sign where they're crying out, please make me feel important. Anyone who's in business, management, marketing will tell you this is, this is key because every single one of us wants to know and be known and to love and to be loved and to be accepted as we are. And yet to realize, too, that we can always be better. Amen? And so the status that these men are seeking brings them power, and that power will always result in pride. And this is what Jesus is attacking. These men are jockeying for position at this important dinner. And it's really a grown-up version of musical chairs. Literally, but without music, which would be re really weird, right? <laughs> and, and what was interesting was that it was a U-shaped situation, right? So you can take a, a U, right? So everyone draw a U on your, on your notes. But don't make the, uh, the corners rounded. Make them square. So just do a U. At the bottom of that U was the person of highest honor spot. Then to the right and left of that person were the next most honorable people. And then it worked towards least and least honor to the very ends and the top of the U. So this was custom. Everyone would walk in the room, know what was going on. And Jesus is watching all these guys clamor for positions of honor. And you just see Jesus kind of hanging back. He's just, you know, he's just leaning against the wall like... Okay, let me tell you guys something, a parable. Verse 7, he says, I'm noticing you guys <laughs> walking about, trying to find that spot of honor, and let me just tell you there's a better way. Choose, choose the, the position of least honor. Don't pick it knowing that I know I'll get bumped up. That's false humility. Don't do that. Like, I remember my wife, uh, she taught music at a school um, years ago, and I remember one time going to one of the big musical presentations, right? And this is one of those things where, man, people come so early and they stake their spots, right? And I walk in and I see, like, choice, choice positions right up front. And I'm like, these people obviously are blind to the best seats in the house. I go strolling up there. Like, part of me is kind of like, if anyone even tries to stop me, like, I think I'm the music teacher's husband. <laughs> you see my credentials, right? I go, and I'm sitting like center stage right there. Someone comes up to me and says, sir, you can't sit here. This is reserved by a family that spent thousands of dollars to have this seat. <laughs> it was for a fundraiser, so don't. And you want to talk about a walk of shame. Every step <laughs> to another seat was humbling. I didn't have my man a t-shirt on, so there's no security blanket, right? I'm leaving those seats, and I got to go over to the seats by the bathroom. The men's bathroom, right? Like that. No one wants to sit by the men's bathroom. <laughs> but this is what today's wisdom tries to tell us, right? How well can you sell yourself? How well can you self-promote you? And I'm going to tell you right now, self-promotion is never Jesus' way. The kind of pride that reduces the importance of others so that your importance is enlarged is not biblical. And not only that, it gives this illusion of things that are really not true. 
Think about it. The spiritual illusion of salvation by recognition, the illusion of eternal life through temporal significance, the illusion of immortality through notoriety. Those things aren't true. So Jesus gives us two great things to consider. Number one, be the humble guest. Be the humble guest. Unlike, and we all know the scene, airplanes landing at the airport, flight attendant comes up. Folks, you've made it to uh, Phoenix, Arizona. 70 degrees and sunny. Whether you're here for work or pleasure, we pray, pray, hope you enjoy a, a wonderful visit here in the Valley of the Sun. Um, please wait till the plane comes to a complete stop. Make sure your trays are upright position, your seatbelt's on. Be careful when you open overhead compartments as things may have shifted during the flight, the plane. And you pull up to the, uh, the, the walkway here in a moment. Uh, the captain will undo the, the stay seated sign and you're free to, uh, to exit the plane. Does anyone ever stop and wait? You talk about self-importance put on display, right? The plane has not even stopped moving. Everyone's jumping up, opening the compartment, standing in line as if we're going to go someplace fast. <laughs> Perfect illustration. Now, I know some of you are going, but what about that person who has a legitimate reason to get off that plane so fast? Fine. That's not majority of the people. Can I get an amen? amen. See, Jesus is saying, stay seated. Right? The guy that gets up and thinks he deserves to be in position number one to get off that plane is the person that's saying, I'm the most important person in my life, and my firstness will be asserted anytime I wish. Can I tell you right now, the who's better games will always lead to the who's bitter reality. There is no contentment for being being better than everybody else. Jesus says, be content with the back seat. Be content. Even Solomon knew this. Proverbs chapter 25. Look what Solomon wrote. 800 years before Jesus. Don't put yourself forward in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great. For it is better to be told, come up here than to be put lower in the presence of, the, of a noble. What your eyes have seen that's it. Okay, good. We don't need any more anyways. That's enough. Be happy with not only who you are, but be happy with where you are. Let God move you to a different chair. Let me, please don't miss this. Because when God moves you, the honor he gives you will be twice as seat because you won't be expecting it. When he moves you, it is a gift of his grace because here's what you need to understand. Honor is not gained. It is given. It is not seized. It is awarded. Do not overestimate your own importance. At what point? This point? Uh, we've made it to Phoenix. Oh, not that far back? Honor is not gained, it is given, and it is not seized, it is awarded. Because the person who thinks it can be gained and seized is the person that thinks too highly of themselves. We tend to overestimate our own importance. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's much better to be honored by God than to try to honor yourself. Here's the kingdom principle. Humbling the proud and exalting the humble is what God does. Even Mary, mother of Jesus, sang this in her song, Luke chapter 1, verse 52. Look what Mary celebrates. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. This is a principal work of the kingdom of God. Why is this important and appropriate for us today? It's because D.C. doesn't believe it. Professional sports don't, doesn't believe it. Ex executives in the business world don't believe it. Wall Street doesn't believe it. Even the church sometimes doesn't believe it. 1 Peter chapter 5. 
Likewise, you who are longer, long, uh, be subject to elders. Um, he opposes the proud. All of you, with humility toward one another, God opposes. Look at that word, opposes. Pride is antithetical to the kingdom of God at work within you. He opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you. I'm going to recommend a very profound movie to you that you need to watch today. I know, it seems like a desert of movies lately, doesn't it? I watched three this week that have absolutely wrecked me in all different ways that were phenomenal. And none of them had Vin Diesel in them. So uh, if you have Hulu, if not, go get a month subscription and cancel. It's free. You need to watch on Hulu in and of itself. In and of itself. So this illusionist, it's a stage play. He's an illusionist, and he incorporates illusion and magic, which I love. But he does it in a way that brings to light the importance and significance of everyone. The value of who you are beyond the labels that you have put upon yourself and the labels people have put upon you. And I'm going to tell you what's fascinating. So Lori and I were talking about this after we watched it. We watched it with our two boys, and there's a little bit of language in it, but it's, let's be honest, it's nothing that no, none of our kids have not heard, right? <laughs> um, even my little guy, Hudson, where's Hudson? Is he here? Oh, he is, okay. He was like, man, that was awesome. 12 years old. This is deep. What you're, what you're going to be amazed at is that who's in the audience of this of this of the stage play and how quickly it passes over worldwide famous people as if they're human just like you and me. Like you're going to watch, when you watch, you're going to be like, oh, that was so-and-so. And they just go right by. Because being human is not the same as being a celebrity. Being a celebrity brings a set of illusions with it that maybe make us feel more important than we ought to feel. But at the bare bones of this, this stage play is this idea that we all are human. We all have been created with intrinsic dignity and value and significance. And perhaps we all need to stop and consider who we are beyond the labels, beyond the titles, beyond all the things people tell us we are. You will cry, you will be moved, and you will tell someone else, watch this. Even on one of my threads, social media threads, because I'm on so many, or even one of my friends said, he posted something about this. I didn't, go and watch this now. And this guy's not even a believer. Because this is not just for believers, this is for humans. Watch it. Because what it does is it brings to point how important humility is as believers in Christ. To model for our world, to love people as they are, where they are. So, so be the humble guest. Whenever you're in a social situation, be the person that seeks the place of lowest honor. When you walk into a room and you see someone not talking to somebody, go beeline it to them. When you see a place that Maybe the table by the bathroom, go sit at that, that table. It'll make the food taste better. <laughs> right? I've, I've been to conferences where you got the celebrity pastors there, and all the pastors walk in, and they all beeline it to what, sit around the famous pastor. I just walked in those rooms. I just sat there and put my manatee shirt on, just put my, my Bible <laughs> down and sit there. And he was cool. one situation, this worldwide famous pastor, right? I was sitting there, he came up to me, and I got a little selfie, and I put it on social media. I was like, man, that's awesome. Like, I didn't have to go and clamor for a table by him. It was like, he came to me. I said, that's awesome. I loved it. So be the humble guest. But also, if you're going to throw a party, be the humble host. 
Because you may be invited or you may be the inviter. What does Jesus have to say? He's not saying don't invite people you, <laughs> you know and you like. and you get, But perhaps you need to add to the invite list people who you normally maybe wouldn't hang out with. Think about this. Look what he says. He says, you know, when you're going to throw a party, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich. He's not saying don't do it, but he's just saying don't make sure the list is exclusively these people. See, he begins to critique this leading Pharisee's guest list, which I love, right? And what's at work is this unending social, you know, uh, social quid pro quo mentality that there's this endless giving and getting. Because the idea is that elitism will foster reciprocity. Reciprocity is saying, I'm doing things for what I can get out of it. I'm loving people from what I can get from them. And you know where humility grows is when you invest your life in someone that you know can't pay you back. <laughs> he says, they're the, they're the lame, they're the crippled, they're the blind, they're the poor. These are the people that God says, I want you to bless. And this goes back to Abraham, Genesis chapter 12. You have been blessed so that you can be a blessing to others and not just bless others that are just like you, but bless others that were in the same condition you were. Loveless, hopeless, friendless, godless. And when you bless people who can't repay you, you are modeling Jesus. Humility and hospitality have this amazing hand-in-hand -hand work with each other. Don't have a pay-me-back mentality, which only ultimately reveals a selfish heart that will ultimately suffer loss at the resurrection. Notice at the end, verse 14, it's the first mention of resurrection in, in Luke's gospel. It took him 14 chapters. Resurrection of Jesus is important. you need to understand that your ultimate resurrection is important as well. And that at that resurrection, God is going to reward you. He is going to commend you. He is going to ask you, how did you not just love the lovely, but how did you love the unlovely? How did you show grace and compassion to those who could never pay you back? Because here's what you don't do. You don't keep a ledger when you love people. You love people and then you forget about loving them. Because there are going to be people you don't get paid back. But here's what God always will do. Whatever you do in his name, he will reward you. Oh, man. If you guys missed the story just a couple days ago, there's a man in, in North Carolina who's a principal at a school where 90% of the students and their families live below the poverty line predominantly black community, this man is a principal of a high school and he takes three nights out of his week to go work the graveyard shift at Walmart so that every paycheck from Walmart can go towards kids who don't have enough to eat, don't have a roof over their heads. I'm going, when does he sleep? When does he spend time with his family? But this man goes to Walmart and his boss at Walmart doesn't even know he's a principal. And he does it. Why? Because he doesn't want people having less. I didn't hear any sense of faith in this man's life. He may be a man of faith. I don't know. But at least he's modeling something that perhaps we as people of faith need to embrace more. Like, what are you doing for others? I mean, let's just be honest, right? The heart of generosity says enough for me, more for others. How are you doing that with your time, treasure, talent? Who are you, who are you inviting over that maybe you would never invite over? Who are you going to invite over and show just incredible hospitality to? I really believe that hospitality is the new evangelism. I truly believe that when you take that person out to lunch that you would never hang out with, and you just show... You, you help them understand that they're the most important person in the world. You want to help them feel important about themselves? 
God's going to do a work. That's what Jesus did. He showed people that were just cast out by the world a love and acceptance and a mercy and a, and a grace that they had never, never, ever felt before. It starts with me. It starts with you. So whether you're going to a party or whether you're throwing a party, guess what? Covers all the bases, doesn't it? Jesus is a master at this. Be helpful, be humble, be hospitable, hospitable, and thus fulfill the mandates of the kingdom of God. And all God's people said, Amen. let's stand, let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for uh, a chance once again to be together as, uh, as family, as a community. Lord, it's such a, a special time and it's a cherished time for us to to realize that we all come from all different walks of life and all different backgrounds, and yet we can, we can come here and connect over things that are central to each and every one of us. That, that as we leave this place, we're entering a, 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 a world that is very much lacking mercy and lacking grace and lacking kindness. May we be the people who are called by your name to be the ones who model the spirit of Jesus to everyone we come in contact with. Root out hypocrisy. Root out this, this clamoring for honor. And, and continue to plant and water the seed of the character of Christ within us. Help us live with eternity in view. Help us to live with the, the importance of men and women's souls that are at stake in view. And help us just to, to model the, the kindness of Christ wherever we go. Thanks for this morning, Lord. Thanks for being our God and for giving us this time together. Be glorified in all things. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord lift His face towards you and give you His grace and peace forever and ever.